Let's review what we've studied so far to see if the teacher's done his job or not. Um, how many books do we find in the book of Daniel? Two. Very well. See, it wasn't over your heads. It was simple. <laughs> how many stages in the judgment? What is the first stage? Investigation. What is the second? The verdict or the sentence. What is the third? The execution of the sentence or the implementation of the sentence. See, you got it. Which is the book that was sealed in the book of Daniel? What part of Daniel was sealed? Primarily which chapters? 8 to 12. And what is the central theme of Daniel 8 through 12? The 2,300 days and the date for the beginning of the judgment. So far so good? Um, how do we know that the little book that was sealed until the time of the end was not the totality of Daniel? We've given four reasons. Reason number one? Two different what? Languages. Number two? Much of Daniel could be understood before the time of the end. Number three, Ellen White explains that the little book was the portion or the part of Daniel that deals with the judgment in the last days. And number four, yesterday we studied the internal evidence of, of Daniel 8 through 12. Are all of these chapters connected with one another? What is the central theme of Daniel 8? The beginning of what? Of the judgment. At the end of which period? At the end of the 2300 days. So the central thought of Daniel 8 is the 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. Does Daniel 8 give us a date for the beginning of the 2300 days? No. Where do we find the date? Daniel 9. So you don't have to understand all of the details. You know, if you have the syllabus, uh, you'll be able to go through the syllabus meditate on it, look up the Bible verses, and as you study it, it'll become clearer and clearer. So, uh, so in Daniel chapter 9, we have the beginning date, so we know when the 2300 days end. I mean, Daniel 8 says 2300 days, but if you don't have a starting point, how are you going to know where it ends? So Daniel 9 is connected to Daniel 8 and the 2300 days because it gives us a date. Now, in Daniel chapter 10, there's a battle going on, right? Gabriel and the prince of Persia. Who's the prince of Persia? Satan is the prince of Persia. What is Satan trying to do with the minds of the kings of Persia? He's saying, hey, don't favor the Jews. Don't let them go back. Don't give any decrees for them to go back. Did they have to go back for the 2300 day prophecy to begin being fulfilled? Yes. Absolutely. Did the devil know that? Of course the devil knew it. On the other hand, Gabriel is there trying to influence the minds of the, of the Persian king saying, hey, favor the Jews. Let them go back. Give the decrees. So that's the battle in Daniel 10. Is Daniel 10 related to the central theme? Yes, because a decree has to be given for the 2300 day prophecy to begin. And for that, the people have to go back to their land. So the focus, once again, is the 2300 days. And then in Daniel 11, what happens? See, in Daniel 8, Gabriel had to suspend the explanation. When he got to the 2300 days, the end of the 2300 days, uh, he said, oh, Daniel, you know, you got sick, so I wasn't able to finish the explanation. So where does he finish the explanation? He finishes the explanation in Daniel 11. Does he begin in Daniel 11 where he began in Daniel 8? Does he begin with Persia? Does he continue with Greece? Does he continue with the first king of Greece? Does he continue with the four divisions of Greece? Does he continue with pagan Rome? Does he continue with papal Rome during the 1260 years? Does he go beyond that to the deadly wound? Yes. Does he go beyond that to the king of the north recovering its power after the deadly wound? Does he take us all the way to the time of trouble? Yes. Does he take us to the close of probation, the standing up of Michael? And does he take us eventually to the special resurrection and the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom? So what is Daniel 11? Daniel 11 is simply completing the vision of Daniel 8 by adding more details. So is Daniel 11 related to Daniel 8? 
do Daniel 8 through 12 have a central theme? They have a central theme. What is the central theme? The 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. Did you get it? Now this is in broad strokes. You have to go to the syllabus and you have to, and uh, we're going to make it possible for others who didn't get the syllabus to be able to get it uh, so, so that you sit down, don't just file this. You know, don't, don't file the syllabus and say, well, we studied that. No, go and look up the Bible verses, read the Ellen White quotations, study the biblical text for yourself, and the more you do, the more it'll make sense. You'll say, wow, I'm in the right church. You know, this is the remnant church. Because the remnant church explains prophecy in the way in which God intended prophecy to be, to be taught. Now, this morning, we are going to give a fifth reason, and we're going to start... Um, you know, the next several topics we're going to deal with this. The fifth reason why we know that the little book is the, is the portion of Daniel that has to do with the time prophecy of the 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. And uh, this is where we are going to study the prophecy of Revelation 10, which is the parallel prophecy to Daniel 8 through 12. Now, I'd like to begin by saying that there is no chapter in all of the Bible that better explains the identity, the origin, the message, and the mission and destiny of the Seventh-day Adventist Church than Revelation chapter 10. This is a critically important chapter. And unfortunately, it's not touched upon very much in evangelism anymore. In fact, in evangelism, we rarely speak about denominational history anymore. But I believe that a study of this chapter will strengthen people within the remnant church. And they will know that they are in the right place because the, they are living in a place where the Bible predicted that they should be. Now, there are three philosophical questions that are, that are commonly asked. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And what is our destiny? Those are the three great philosophical questions. Now, if we don't know our roots, we will not realize the immense privilege of belonging to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we will fail to realize what our message and mission are. If we don't know what our origin was, we don't know why we exist. That's basically what I'm saying. We will feel no particular pride in belonging to not just any church, but to the remnant church. And of course, you know, these days, some of the intelligentsia in the church, which means the highly educated ones, are embarrassed about the origin of our church. They have concluded that our pioneers were a group of uneducated individuals who had no higher education degrees, and therefore they were highly deficient in their theology. Like the leaders of the Jewish Sanhedrin perceived Peter and John, they perceived that the pioneers were uneducated and untrained. Some liberal publications, such as Spectrum and Adventist Today, they're published by lay people, very liberal lay people, would just as soon erase our history from our history, the sanctuary, 1844, and the Great Disappointment. They would like the Seventh-day Adventist Church to be just like all other churches perhaps with a little sprinkling of doctrines that are typically Adventist, like the Sabbath. This is a great tragedy, because if we don't know the prophecies that have made us the people that we are, we will simply come to the conclusion that our church is one among many. In this study of Revelation 10, we will allow the Bible to explain itself by comparing one text with another. That is the Seventh-day Adventist method. The Holy Spirit inspired Scripture and placed in Scripture everything we need to understand Scripture. We don't need commentaries. We don't need books to interpret the Bible for us. I'm not saying that commentaries are bad or books are bad. It's good to read books and commentaries. But if we didn't have books and commentaries, we could still make sense of the Bible. Because the Holy Spirit placed in the Bible everything we need to understand the Bible. In other words, the Bible is self-contained. 
Now, we're going to use many different sources in the Bible to explain Revelation chapter 10. We're going to use many verses. The key is that those verses have to be in some way related to Revelation 10. You know, you can't just take a text that's talking about something totally different and plug it into Revelation 10. The texts have to be related to the theme of Revelation 10 in order to use one scripture to explain another scripture. Uh, one point that I would like to underline in this study, we will see that Revelation chapter 10 predicted the origins of the Great Advent Movement, and it's described in minute detail. As we move along, we are going to use the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. And let me uh, begin by giving an explanation concerning that specifically. Uh, it was in the state of Florida, a few months ago that I was, I was presenting this series in a Spanish church. And after the meeting, a lady came up to me and she said, Pastor Bohr, this is all very interesting, but how do you present this to a person who is not a Seventh-day Adventist who does not believe in the spirit of prophecy? Because, of course, you're going to see I use a lot of spirit of prophecy to describe what happened in the Great Advent Movement. And now she, was, she wasn't being facetious, she was being very sincere. She wanted to know how this could be presented to people who are not Adventists. In my answer, I underlined two specific things. Number one, I told her, this would never be the first Bible study that you would give to someone who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. There are certain doctrines that other, that other people have to understand in order for them to understand this one. So I said, before uh, you give this Bible study, you would have to acquaint them with the sanctuary service. You would have to acquaint them with the doctrine of the investigative judgment. You would have to acquaint them with uh, the history of the church, particularly the role of the spirit of prophecy in the church. Once you've done that, then people would be prepared to understand the importance and the meaning of Revelation chapter 10. That was my first point. My second point was that it's not fair to demand that this topic be studied only with the Bible and not include the spirit of prophecy. And uh, people wonder, why, why do you say that it's not fair to expect to study this only from the Bible and not use the spirit of prophecy? There's a very important reason. Let's take, for example, the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. Does the Bible say that the little horn of Daniel 7 was historically fulfilled in the papacy? No, it doesn't. Do you find in the Bible the word papacy? No. What does the Bible give us? The Bible gives us the characteristics of the little horn. It speaks blasphemies against the Most High. We have to discover what blasphemy is. It persecutes the saints of the Most High. It claims to have changed God's law. And it rules for 1,260 years. So we have the characteristics. What do we have to do with those characteristics? We have to go outside the Bible to history and find the fulfillment of those characteristics in history. Correct? Let's take, for example, another example. Uh, does the Bible mention the United States of America? No. How do we know that the United States of America is in Bible prophecy? We go to Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 to 18. We study all of the characteristics of this beast that rises from the earth, and with the characteristics, we go into history to discover what it is that fulfills this prophecy, the characteristics of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 13. So the Bible gives us the description, but we have to go beyond the Bible to history in order to find the system that is fulfilled by those characteristics. Are you with me or not? Would it be fair to say that we can only study Revelation 10 from the Bible itself and we can't go to history to discover when Revelation 10 was fulfilled? Absolutely not. And let me share this. Ellen White is a particular authority when it comes to describing what happened in Revelation 10 because she was there. She was an eyewitness. She was not a historian that lived later and you know, she's looking back on history and describing history. She was there. She was an eyewitness 
two things that happen. So her description is of particular authority. Are you following me or not? So to say, well, you have to go to history to find the meaning of the little horn. You have to go to history to find the meaning of the United States. But you, don't, you can't go to history to understand Revelation 10. That's not fair. We have to look for the fulfillment of Revelation 10 in history. Are you with me or not? So the two points are, number one, don't give this as the first Bible study. It will go over people's heads like it's gone over some people's heads here. <laughs> and secondly, don't, uh, don't expect to explain things from Revelation 10 alone because Revelation 10 had a fulfillment in history. So you have to find out by the characteristics of Revelation 10 when this was fulfilled in history. Are you with me? Is this fair? Of course it's fair. It's fair with all of Bible prophecy. Let me ask you, can you understand uh, Daniel chapter 2 without going to history? The head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, ten toes. Can, can you explain Daniel 2 without going to history? No. Can you explain Revelation 10 without going to history? No. So don't expect, don't say, oh, you can't use Ellen White. You can use Ellen White. Because she's describing the fulfillment of Revelation 10 in history. Now, let's read this passage. We're going to read the entire chapter of Revelation chapter 10. And there are certain things that I have underlined. And after we read the passage, then I'm going to describe the sequence of events. Because in Revelation 10, we have a chain of events. One after another. Chronologically, one after another. And uh, every detail was fulfilled in its precise order in the 1844 movement. Now, this Revelation 10 is happening in the context of the sixth trumpet. You know, as Adventists, we believe that the trumpets, the churches, the seals, and the trumpets describe history, right? From the apostolic days till the end of time. We believe that Ephesus is the apostolic church, Laodicea is the end time church, and the other churches are in between. They show the flow of history. We believe that the seals also begin in apostolic times. And they, the different seals and events are fulfilled in the course of history, culminating with a half hour of silence in heaven, which is the, the second coming of Christ. And we believe that the seven trumpets, even though some people are trying to project them to the future, which is very, very dangerous, because when it does, it demeans the fulfillment of this in the Advent movement. When you see Revelation 10 is the, during the sixth trumpet. If you're saying that all the trumpets are going to be fulfilled in the future, then you're taking out Revelation 10 from its historical context, which is extremely dangerous because it's powerful within the flow, within the chain where God has placed it. When you take it out of the chain, you place it over there. You don't have a chain. You have a link, an individual link. And so this is taking place during the period of the sixth trumpet. So must this be taking place early in the history of the Christian church or late in the history of the Christian church? It has to be late. Because it's the next to last trumpet. Five of them have already passed. It's number six. In other words, the fulfillment of this chapter is not in apostolic times. It's not during papal supremacy. It is when? It is at the very end of time that this is taking place. Now let's uh, go to Revelation 10 and read the passage. And uh, you have it on the screen. This, uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says the following. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. I want you to use your imagination. We have the description of this mighty angel. He's not an angel. It's a mighty angel that descends from heaven. So it describes his physical appearance. Uh, he's surrounded by a cloud, a rainbow over his head. His face shines like the sun. His feet are like pillars of fire. Then verse 2 says, He had a little book open. And you'll find in brackets there, I've added, the tense of the verb. We're going to go there in a, minute, in a few minutes. 
really the tense of the verb says, he had in his hand a little book having been opened. In other words, before the book was opened, it was what? Closed. Is there any place in the Bible that you can think of a book that was closed that, uh, until a certain time and it was supposed to be opened at that certain time? Daniel 8 through 12, right? Is this connected to Daniel 8 through 12? Absolutely. It continues saying, And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So this mighty angel plants his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. This is all symbolic, by the way. This is not a literal angel that descends from heaven. You know, and he puts one leg on the sea and another leg on the land. No, all of this is symbolic language that expresses a reality in symbolic form. Are you following me or not? Um, it's like the second coming of Jesus in Revelation 19. You know, it says he comes to trample the wine press. And that out of the wine press comes blood. And it splatters on the horses. And out of his mouth comes a sword. You know, Jesus is coming, but the sword is symbolic. The wine press is symbolic. In other words, uh, the, the events, the literal events are expressed in symbolic language. In other words, things are going to really occur. But the symbols explain how these things are going to occur. Of course, trampling on the wine press means that he's going to, he's going to deliver his people from the wicked that want to destroy God's people. The sword that comes from his mouth is his what? His word. He says, it is done. When he says that, then the wicked are dispersed. And, uh, you know, horse represents the coming of a mighty conqueror. So, so it's not that Jesus isn't coming, but his coming is described in symbolic terms. And so we have a symbolic portrayal here of something that happened in 1844. So it continues saying, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And after he does that, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. So in other words, he, he, his voice is like the roar of a lion. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices, which are really the echoes of his voice. So notice the sequence. Uh, he cries out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cries out, the next point is seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, John says, I was about to write. Did John understand what the seven thunders said? Of course he did. He was going to write it. <laughs> did he understand what the seven thunders uttered? Yeah, he says, I was about to write. You say, but th nobody understands thunders. Thunders are noise. But we need to understand, uh, we're going to go to another passage in the Gospel of John. Where, where Jesus, Jesus says, glorify your son. And the voice of his father said, I've glorified it and I will glorify it again. And the reaction of the people who were there was, some of them said, it thundered. And other people said, an angel has spoken to him. So the thunders are not noise, they utter a message. And John understands the message. Because he says, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, what? Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. So John understood what the seven thunders said. But he was commanded to what? To seal them. In other words, it's not good for the people who read this to know this at this point. Verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore, this is the next point in the, in the chain, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it. This is a clear reference to what? To the fourth commandment. It's language from the Sabbath. And ultimately, it's language that comes from Genesis 2. So somehow, this angel is going to attract attention to the Creator. And so it says, what, what the oath was, that there should be delay no longer. This is a horrendous translation. 
on the part of the New King James Version. The, the King James is correct. The King James says that time would be no longer. We're going to address all of these issues as we study along. But uh, the correct translation is that there should be time no longer. In other words, the angel swears an oath, he raises his hand, and he swears an oath that time will be no longer. But he's not finished. Now, uh, it continues saying in verse 7, now verse 7 is not sequential to verse 6. In other words, verse 7 is a parenthesis. It breaks the flow of thought. Verse 7 is fulfilled at the very end of Revelation chapter 10. It's an explanatory note, so it should go in parentheses, and we'll deal with this. It says, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So, so when the seventh trumpet is about to sound, what is going to come to an end? The mystery of God is going to come to an end. And then when the trumpet sounds, what happens? Jesus takes over the kingdom under the seventh trumpet. And we'll, we'll, I just want you to catch the sequence now, the idea, without the interpretation, because we're going to study these all in detail. Verse 8, next event in the chain. The voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again. You see in a chain of events here? Spoke to me again. After, that is, after telling him not to write what the seven thunders uttered. And said, go take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said, take it and eat it. How many of you have ever eaten a book before? Which book, which book is uh, John commanded to eat here? Daniel 8 to 12. And the central theme is what? the 2300 days and the judgment, right? So he's told to eat that. By the way, people don't go around eating books. It's a symbolic language, right? And we'll see what that means. So, so he says, go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And now you have an interesting order here. It, it seems to be not the right order. Because it says, and he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will be the sweetest honey in your mouth. Are you seeing something unusual here? Is your stomach bitter before you eat it in your mouth? No. It goes to your mouth and has to go to the stomach. But here he says, it'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it'll be sweet. Why is the order reversed? There's a reason, which we won't go into now. See, we need to be careful with every detail. Every detail in the Bible is important. So, so it says, take it and eat it. Now, make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Now comes the proper order. John says, then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Now it's in the right order when John eats it, right? Verse 11, and he said to me, the same angel, you must what? Prophesy again. And I like the better the, transla the translation of the King James to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And then chapter 11 and verse 1 actually belongs to chapter 10. It's the conclusion to chapter 10. The chapter was divided in the wrong place. In the book of Revelation, believe it or not, there are several places where the chapter division is in the wrong place. You say, now pastor, you're fiddling with the Bible. Chapters and verses were not there originally. They were added for our convenience. Imagine trying to find Isaiah 23 verse 5 with no chapters or verses. That would be a tall order. So for our convenience, the Bible is divided in, in verses and in chapters. But it's not part of the inspiration of Scripture, if you please. In Revelation, you have several places where the chapter division is in the wrong place. Revelation 11.1 belongs with chapter 10. 
Let me give you another couple of examples in the book of Revelation where the chapter division is problematic. Revelation chapter 13 describes the trial, the last few verses describe the trial over the beast, his image, and his mark. Whoever does not, re, who does not worship the image will be killed. If you don't receive the mark, you won't be able to buy or sell. And so the chapter ends by mentioning the number of the beast, 666. Revelation 13, 11 to 18 is not complete. Because when the chapter ends, you say, well, was there anybody who remained faithful? Did everybody receive the mark of the beast? You're left with that question. Revelation 14 verse 5 says that there's a group, the 144,000, that were sealed with the seal of God. Are you with me? So really, Revelation 14, 1 through 5, presents those who are victorious over the beast, his image, and his mark. So Revelation 14, 1 through 5, could have very well belonged to chapter 13, as the climax of chapter 13. Let me give you another example. Revelation chapter 21. Could I borrow somebody's Bible? I have, I have my Bible on my computer. Uh, I, I want to show you something very interesting here in Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> Let me ask you, does the holy city, New Jerusalem, descend from heaven before the wicked are destroyed or after? We all know it descends before, right? But now we have a little problem. Notice Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the soul, holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. If you read that in chronological order, when does the holy de city descend? After God makes a new heavens and a new earth. Are you with me? Revelation 21 verse 1 belongs, belongs with chapter 20. Because chapter 20 ends by speaking about the destruction of the wicked, and then it says, Then I saw new heavens and a new earth. And Revelation 21 verse 2 begins a new cycle. In other words, Revelation chapter uh, 21 and verse 2 takes us back, takes us back to describe events that happened before God made a new heavens and a new earth. Are you with me or not? So, so there are many places in Revelation, there's at least... There's at least four or five places in the book of Revelation where the chapter division is in the wrong place. And of course, only Adventists would know that. <laughs> and I don't say that arrogantly, but it's the truth. Because only Adventists understand the sequence of end time events. The Christian world today is totally misguided when it comes to Bible prophecy. They don't have the foggiest idea where things are leading. They're all looking to the Middle East. Even some Adventist individuals are looking to the Middle East. They're saying, oh, ISIS and, the, you know, Turkey is going to rise again. They're looking all to the East. And meanwhile, the papacy grows in Rome, and the United States is fulfilling prophecy, and nobody can see it because they're looking in the wrong place. The devil is an expert in distraction, in leading people to look where, where things are not happening. But Adventists, we know what the chain is. The enemies at the end of time, folks, are not Turkey and ISIS. The enemies of the end time are the papacy and apostate Protestantism, joining with the kings of the earth. Let me ask you this. How many times does Ellen White mention Turkey in the future fulfillment of prophecy? Not once does Ellen White mention Turkey as a fulfillment of prophecy in the end time. Let me ask you, how many of the great uh, chain prophecies of the Bible mention Turkey? Does Daniel 2 mention Turkey? Does Daniel 7 mention Turkey? Does Daniel 8 mention Turkey? Does Revelation 12 mention Turkey? Does Revelation 13 mention Turkey? Does Revelation 17 mention Turkey? Oh, but the king of the north is Turkey. It doesn't make any sense. It's a distraction. It leads people's eyes over there. When prophecy is being fulfilled in the United States and in Rome, 
People can't see it because you're looking in the wrong place. And, and of course, uh, the Christian world is, expect is expecting to be raptured out of this world before uh, the tribulation. So they we're not going to be here. So why would you even study Revelation if it's talking about things after the church is raptured? The devil said, you don't have to study that book because you're going to be in heaven when those things take place. The devil, you know, the devil is going to die of insomnia because while we're sleeping, he's studying. And of course he's studying so that he can find out how to counteract the plan of God. So let's go back here to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1, which is really part of chapter uh, 10. Uh, the angel says, You must prophesy again about two many people's nations, tongues and kings. Then I was giving a reed like a measuring rod. Who gave him the, me the, the reed like the measuring rod? Was it the same angel? Yes. So is this a continuation of what we have before? Yes. Then, it says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And I'll get ahead of myself a little bit. Measuring. What would that would be referring to? Measure. It says measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. That's the sanctuary, isn't it? Measure the sanctuary. Those who worship in the sanctuary. What does measure mean? The Bible says that measure means judgment. What happens after the disappointment? Were God's people to call, be called upon to proclaim the hour of God's judgment? Is that our message? Absolutely. Now, let's go through this chapter step by step. Let's summarize what we have noticed so far. A chain of events. I want you to remember the sequence of events. Because they were fulfilled to a T in the movement that led up to the year 1844. At the very center of this chapter is the mighty angel. And notice the sequence of events. The angel descended from heaven to the earth. It's the first point. Then the angel's physical characteristics were described. Then the angel who descended from heaven has a scroll in his hand. And it's what? open, which means that he must have opened it before he came to the, to the earth, right? Are you with me or not? He must have opened it before he descended to the earth. So he has in his hand an open scroll. By the way, we're going to notice something very interesting. This same angel is found in Daniel chapter 10 and chapter 12, primarily chapter 12. In chapter 12 of Daniel, it says that the angel raises both hands to heaven and swears an oath in the name of the eternal God. But in Revelation chapter 10, it says he only raises one hand. Why? Because in Revelation chapter 10, he has the little book in his left hand. See, details are important. Okay, we continue. So he descends from heaven. At some point before this, he opened this, this scroll because the little book is really a scroll. There were no codices, uh, bound books like we have now in biblical times. Everything was written on scrolls. So a better translation would be a scroll. And then what does the angel do? He descends with the open scroll to the earth and then he plants his right foot on the sea and he plants his left foot on the land. And once he's planted his feet, he lets out a roar like the roar of a lion. And the roar like a lion utters seven thunders. And John is about to write what the seven thunders uttered, which means that he understood what they said. And he was commanded to what? He was commanded to seal the message. It was not best for people to know what the thunders uttered at this point in history. Because we're this is taking us to that period in history. And so then, the angel raises his hand, most likely the right hand, that's the hand that we swear with, to heaven. And he swore an oath. And the oath was in the name of the eternal God, the creator. And the language comes 
from the fourth commandment and ultimately from Genesis 2, the Sabbath commandment. And he swears an oath. And he swears in this oath that time will be no longer. Time has come to an end. And we're going to talk about that time. It's not talking about the end of the world. It's a different kind of time. Would the word time link us with 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed? Is there just a possibility that we're dealing with that time that will be no longer because that time has come to an end? Hmm. We're going to prove it. And so, after the oath, then John is given the book. And John is told to eat the book. And it will be bitter in your stomach, but it will be sweet in your mouth. So, uh, John goes and he says to the angel, give me the book. And John eats the book. It's sweet in his mouth and it's bitter in his stomach. So somehow this was a sweet message when he ate it. But it became bitter in the aftermath. And it's the message concerning the judgment because that's the central theme of the book. Somehow the judgment message was going to be a sweet experience at first, but then it was going to become bitter. Are you catching the interesting picture here? And then he's told, prophesy again. Let's just stop a minute there. Prophesy again. Can you do something again that you haven't done at least once before? When he's told to prophesy again, it must be prophesy again the same prophecy they gave the first time. Right? So, is there going to be further light after this bitter disappointment? Where the same message has to come forth with the new understanding. Absolutely. So he's told prophesy again and then he's told to measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship there the measuring of the sanctuary and those who worship in the sanctuary will take place. And then uh, verse 7, which I said is parenthetical, and we'll, we'll see this. Verse 7 speaks about the finishing of the mystery of God when the seventh trumpet is about to sound. In other words, the mystery of God ends when the sixth trumpet is coming to an end and when the seventh trumpet is about to begin. Not when the seventh trumpet sounds, but when the seventh trumpet is about to begin to sound, the mystery of God is finished. And we're going to find that that refers to the close of human probation. And then the seventh trumpet sounds, that's the next event in the sequence, the seventh trumpet sounds, and it says the kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of Christ, and he will rule forever and ever. Do you see the chain of events? Okay, now we're going to uh, interpret. We're going to interpret the meaning of Revelation 10 verse by verse in its order. Let's talk first of all about the messenger that is spoken of in Revelation 10. There's no doubt whatsoever that the messenger in Revelation 10 is none other than Jesus Christ himself. The one who descends with the little book in his hand the little book open, is none other than Jesus Christ. And you say, how do we know that? There are several characteristics. Number one, John did not see an ordinary angel. He saw a what? A mighty angel. It's not like I saw another angel in the midst of heaven, another angel followed him, then a third followed them. Just the word angels. This is a mighty angel. What's the name of this mighty angel? Michael. Michael. Did any of you watch the sermon that I preached at Fresno Central Church a couple of weeks ago on um, Israel's guardian angel? If we finish this in due time, the last presentation I'm going to have is going to be on Michael. Israel's guardian angel. It's powerful. This is Michael. So he's a mighty angel. Secondly, his face shines like the noonday sun. If you go to Revelation 1, it speaks about Jesus in his glorified form. It says his face was like the sun. 
Also, we notice that he's surrounded by a cloud. Who in the Bible is surrounded by a cloud? Jesus is always surrounded by clouds. What do the feet of Jesus look like in Revelation 1? Like pillars of fire. Is that the same with this angel? Absolutely. He speaks like the roar of a lion. Who's represented by a lion in the Bible? Jesus. He's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. The rainbow is over his head. Does this mean that the door of mercy is open? Is the door of mercy still open at this point? Yes. Notice this statement from Education, page 115. As the bow in the cloud results from the union of sunshine and shower, so the bow above God's throne represents the union of His mercy and His justice. To the sinful but repentant soul, God says, Live thou, I have found a ransom. So when Revelation 10 is occurring, the door of mercy is still open. People can still be saved. Finally, Ellen White herself identifies this angel as Jesus. In Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 971, she states the mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. And in volume 7, 953, 954, she explains the instruction to be communicated to John was so important that Christ came from heaven to give it to his servant, telling him to send it to the churches. So who is the messenger? Must this be a very important message if Jesus himself is the one that's bringing it? It must be extremely important. Now let's talk about the little book. Daniel 12 verse 4. Let's read that verse. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Was it going to be sealed forever? No, no until. So until means it's, it's not going to be sealed forever. Until the time of the end. Many, I've added the word eyes because it's used in the Psalms to describe the eyes of God running to and fro. So many shall run to and fro and knowledge of what? <coughs> knowledge of the book that was sealed shall increase. Because the book at this point has been what? Unsealed. Now here's my question. What is the central theme of that little book? You know, my wife tells me that I repeat too much. And you know what I tell my wife? I say, how do you suppose that a parrot learns to talk? <laughs> By repeating a phrase to him. Over and over and over again, then the parrot learns and repeats it. See, uh, you know, repetition is the master of learning. How do you memorize? You memorize by repetition. And so it's very important to repeat to make sure that we're understanding all of the details. So this little book we've already identified as Daniel 8 through 12, whose central theme is the 2300 days and the date for the beginning of the judgment. The judgment. That's the central theme of this book. Now here's the question. Do you suppose that later on in history, in the Bible, there might be some place where the unsealing of the little book would be presented? Would you expect another place where there would be a scroll or a book that now the seal would be removed so that people could understand it? Of course. Where is the only place in the Bible that you find a little book where the seal is taken out, the book is opened? Revelation 10. It's the only one that links Revelation 10 with Daniel chapter 8. Are you with me? Very important. Now, it's important to realize the tense of the verb. If you read the translation, it says, He had in his hand a little book open. But literally, uh, in the Greek, the original language, this is a passive perfect tense, participle for those who are English buffs. Now, what is a perfect tense? A perfect tense is an event that started in the past that continues in the present. Let me give you an example. I have been with you for three days. When did I start being with you? Am I still with you? That's a perfect tense. I have been with you for three days. 
the action began in the past and it endures to the present. So when it says that this angel, this Jesus Christ descends from heaven with the little book having been opened, it means that before he descends the book was what? The book was open, which means that it must have been before closed. Now, as we studied in our first lecture, very top of the screen, we only have a couple minutes left. The little book consisted of Daniel 8, 1 through 12, 4, particularly the portion relating to the 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. The little book was opened when the first angel's message was preached beginning in 1798, right? Now, we're going to deal, deal with 1 to 3 and then we'll bring this to an end. Daniel 8, 14 gives us the timing for the beginning of the judgment. Daniel 8, 14 gives us the timing for the beginning of the judgment. 2300 days. And the sanctuary will be cleansed or the judgment will begin. Daniel 7 provides us with a description of that event from a heavenly perspective. Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7 describes the proclamation of that message on earth. Are you following me or not? So, Revelation 8 gives us the timing. Daniel 7 gives us the description of what happens when that time comes in heaven. And Revelation 14, verse 7 speaks about the proclamation, the hour of His judgment has come on earth. So you have to link Daniel 8, 14 with Daniel 7 and with Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Well, our time is up. We need to read these statements from the Spirit of Prophecy when we come back at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Make sure you're here uh, because uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to follow a chain of reasoning. You know, once we're finished, you'll be able to see all the links in the chain, how they were fulfilled precisely and exactly in the course of the history of the Advent Movement leading up to 1844. Were you able to follow what we looked at today? Yes? Well, there's two or, oh, two or three of you who say yes. <laughs> I, I tried to make it as simple as possible. I hope that uh, we're able to follow. As we go along, things will start clicking. I'm sure that things will start clicking. You say, oh, no, no, I get it, I get it. So just be patient. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. This people would not exist if it wasn't for, for prophecy. How sad it is, Father, that the sacrifices that were made by the pioneers to hammer out the prophetic message of our church is being questioned by people who never even contributed an inch to the edification of this church. Father, I ask that you will help us to come to the point in our study where we will feel proud in the right sense of the word to belong to your remnant movement. Not only proud to belong to it, but that we might feel the responsibility, the awesome responsibility of sharing this message that the world needs so desperately. Thank you, Father, for having been with us, and we ask that you will continue to bless us with your presence. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.